10, NKJV, those pesky little pronouns. The first time the devil shows up in the Bible he is sitting under the tree of knowledge and he hasn't moved since. Martin Luther, the success of the New King James Version, the NKJV, albeit limited, is attributable to two primary factors, the retention of King James in its title and the recommendation of this version by some of the more conservative Christian television and radio personalities. The NKJV should be classified as one of the subtlest Bible versions on the market, Genesis 3 verse 1. By promoting and marketing this version as an authentic King James Bible, many people who would never consider picking up another modern version have been misled into buying the NKJV. Although the changes found in the NKJV are less pervasive than those found in the other versions, the New King James Version corrupts truth in many of the same ways. The New King James Version is the modern translation with the greatest similarities to the King James Bible. Nevertheless, the NKJV makes an estimated 100,000 translation changes to the KJB. This figure averages to over 80 changes per page and approximately 3 changes per verse. While claiming to follow the majority text of the King James Bible, when the NKJV differs from the KJB it does so by following the corrupt readings of the Alexandrian manuscripts. The changes found in the NKJV are too numerous to list completely. Some significant removals in the NKJV when compared to the KJB are as follows. 0 0.22 omissions of hell. 23 omissions of blood. 0 0.44 omissions of repent. 48 omissions of heaven, 51 omissions of God, 66 omissions of Lord. In addition to the above deletions, the words devils, damnation, Jehovah, and New Testament are omitted completely from the text of the NKJV. In the New Testament alone, the NKJV removes 2,289 words from the KJB. The Old Testament is also replete with changes. The changes begin in Genesis and continue through the book of the Revelation. The student of God's word must recognize that things that are different are not the same. To begin the comparison on the NKJV, consider the various influences brought to bear on this modern version. God promised the first man a help meet. Compare for yourself the changes and see if they convey the same thought and meaning. KJB Genesis 2 verse 18 And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone, I will make him an help meet for him. The Bible says that God made a help meet for Adam. Notice the New King James Version slant toward the women's liberation philosophy in this verse. NKJV Genesis 2 verse 18 And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone, I will make him a helper comparable to him. A helper comparable to him sounds too much like the 50 to 50 concept promoted by many modern marriage counselors. The love, respect, and loyalty should be equal. The marriage itself cannot have two heads of home. The husband is the head of the home, Ephesians 5 verse 23, and the wife is to be subject to him, Ephesians 5 verse 24. When the environment in the homes, Christian homes included, does not align itself with the scriptures in this respect, chaos abounds. The Bible does not infer that the man is superior, but does say that the woman was made as a help for the man. The husband should consider that God gives him only one key instruction, repeating it three times. Husbands are to love their wives, love their wives, love their wives, Ephesians 5 verses 25 and 28, 33. Although Thomas Nelson publishers decided to begin their version with a slant toward the women's liberation movement, the main focus of this chapter is the NKJV's deletion of many of the pronouns found in the KJB. These pronouns help convey the true meaning of many past guests and offer the Bible student with some advanced understanding. The pronouns thee, thy, thine, and ye. The New King James Version claims that its pronoun changes are a positive feature and a reason to buy their version. Here is what they have done. The NKJV changes thee, thy, thine, and ye to the appropriate conjugations of the generic pronoun you. This alteration appears to be very simple, but is it really a positive feature to the words of God? The introduction to the New King James Version reads as follows. Readers of the authorized version, their primary advertising focus and the majority of their customer base will immediately be struck by the absence of several pronouns, thee, thou, and ye are replaced by the simple you, while your and yours are substituted for thy and thine as applicable. These pronouns, from the old archaic KJB, are no longer a part of our language. 
Throughout their investigations, the publishers have observed that the real character of the authorized version does not reside in its archaic pronouns, too. These statements from the NKJV introduction are completely false. For instance, the King James Bible's second-person pronouns, the and ye, etc., help to provide a distinct sound to the Word of God, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 7. People always know that you are reading a Bible when they hear the King James read. Furthermore, what authority do the publishers, Thomas Nelson publishers, etc., have in determining whether something in the Bible is necessary or now superfluous? Are these pronouns really archaic, or are they simply the language of the Bible? What saith the Scripture? Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 Scriptural justification exists and scriptural instruction demands leaving these words intact. Likewise, as will be demonstrated shortly, these pronouns are grammatically necessary for a clearer understanding of the biblical text. Purpose of the various pronouns, thee, thy, thine, and ye. Every modern version without exception replaces these pronouns with the generic you. Does God have a reason for using these particular pronouns, or can they simply be eliminated? Are these more precise pronouns important, or can a generic replacement convey the same precision? Background, the Greek and Hebrew languages both distinguish between the second person singular and second person plural pronouns. Because the King James Bible is a direct translation from the Hebrew and Greek, rather than simply an eclectic translation, it too incorporates these distinctions. The KJB utilizes distinguishing pronouns, singular the and plural ye, thus retaining the singular and plural distinction found in the original languages. The generic you would not meet the criteria demanded by God and incorporated by the King James Bible translators. Admittedly, the English language has changed considerably over the centuries. However, choosing imprecise words to replace more precise words is unacceptable, unjustifiable, and clearly unscriptural. Simplicity God has provided an easy way for determining the singular or plural nature of a particular pronoun. If the pronoun begins with T, thou, thy, thine, it is singular. If the pronoun begins with y, ye, you, it is plural. Simple as that. T is singular. Y is plural. O.T. Oswald Alice investigated the matter rather thoroughly and stated his conclusions quite succinctly. Alice informs us that the pronouns used in the KJB are not simply a reflection of the modern-day words used by the translators and their contemporaries in 1611. It is incorrect to claim that the thou represents the usage of the 1611 period when the AV was prepared and that that usage is out of date and should be rejected for that very reason. Such a claim misrepresents the facts. The AV usage is not Jacobean or 17th century English. It is Biblical English. The Greek of the New Testament distinguishes between the singular and the plural forms of the second person. The AV makes this distinction simply because NT Greek does so, and because that is the only way to translate the Bible correctly. Point two. Truth sheds an amazing light on well-established error. Modern version translators sacrifice clarity when the generic you of the New King James Version replaces the singular and plural pronouns of the King James Bible. What may seem to be a simple change actually has far-reaching implications. Amazingly, these points hold true when considering the Old Testament Hebrew to English translation, as well as the New Testament Greek to English translation. Examples thousands of passages could be considered. However, only five illustrations are provided demonstrating the singular and plural nature of the pronouns of the KJB. These examples communicate the importance of retaining the use of these separate pronoun groups. Each example shows both the singular and plural usage of the pronouns. Acts chapter 5 records the story of Ananias and Sapphira and their disobedience. Peter discusses with Sapphira her own sin and that of her husband. He says, ye have agreed together, they were in collusion. Next, Peter turns his attention to Sapphira and tells her that the men have carried out thy husband and will carry thee out next. The passage illustrates the plural and then the singular usage of the second person pronouns. KJB Acts 5 verse 9 Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Although one can sometimes determine the singular or plural nature of a pronoun by its context,
this is not always the case. The NKJV uses the generic you in place of the more precise ye, thy, and thee of the King James Bible. NKJV Acts 5 verse 9 Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. This example from Acts chapter 5 shows the differences in pronoun usage between the NKJV and the KJB. In this case, the singular or plural meaning of the word you is easily discernible simply from the context of the passage. However, this determination is often much more difficult to make. The Bible's explicit instructions frequently refer to a general audience before turning singular, dealing on an individual basis. In Revelation chapter 2, we read that many believers will be persecuted for 10 days. The passage further states that if the individual is faithful unto death, he will receive a reward. KJB Revelation 2 verse 10 Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In other words, only those saints individually who withstand the ten days of persecution will be rewarded with a crown of life. Not all of the ye spoken of in this passage will endure to the end, Matthew 24 verse 13, to be rewarded. It would be incorrect to say be ye faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. The rewards are individually based, not collectively earned by a group. The NKJV makes no such distinction in the parallel passage here or in any of the other modern versions. NKJV Revelation 2 verse 10 Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. The NKJV passage is considered first in the next comparison. Read the verse from the New King James Version and then answer the questions found after the passage. Each of the answers should be either the apostles collectively or Peter alone. NKJV Luke 22 verse 31 And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Indeed, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. 32 But I have prayed for you, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Who did Satan desire to sift as wheat? Who did the Lord pray for? Who was to strengthen the brethren? This passage illustrates another clear example of the loss of truth resulting from this simple change of pronouns. Every word of God is pure. Proverbs 30 verse 5. Now read the corresponding passage from the True King James Bible and notice the singular and plural natures of the pronouns incorporated into the KJB. KJB Luke 22 verse 31 And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. 32 But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. The King James Bible is much clearer simply as a result of using numerically specific second-person pronouns. The Lord is speaking to Simon Peter and telling him that Satan desired to have the apostles, you plural. But the Lord says to Simon Peter that he prayed for him, the singular, that his faith, thy singular, would not fail. He alone was instructed to strengthen, thy singular, brethren when he, thou singular, was converted. Much truth is lost by tampering with the word of God. The Lord prayed for Peter, not the group which included Judas Iscariot. Judas was not going to strengthen his brethren. In fact, Judas was not even one of the brethren. Therefore, Judas is not included in the thee of the KJB. Here is another example to further drive home the distinction. Notice that the Lord is speaking to Moses in transitions to including the Jewish nation in the dialogue, Thus thou, Moses, shalt say, Ye, Israel, have seen. I think you get the idea. KJB Exodus 20 verse 22 And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. 23 Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. 24 An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. God instructs Moses on what he is to say to the nation of Israel. 
God commands Moses to remind Israel that God has spoken directly to them and that they are not to make their own gods. However, when Moses addresses Israel regarding the appropriate sacrifices, he is instructed by God to bring the issue down to an individual level. These important truths are only grasped by incorporating both the singular and plural pronouns. Another example follows revealing the loss of clarity when using a modern version like the NKJV. NKJV Exodus 20 verse 22 Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. 23 You shall not make anything to be with me gods of silver or gods of gold you shall not make for yourselves. 24 An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name I will come to you, and I will bless you. There is no distinction in any of the modern versions concerning who is being spoken to or directed by God. The passage is unambiguously clear in the KJB and befuddled by modern versions writers. The next example concerns the story of Nicodemus coming to the Lord secretly. In this passage, the Lord addresses a single individual, Nicodemus, concerning direction for a multitude of people, the nation of Israel. KJB John 3 verse 7 Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, thee, about the nation of Israel, ye. He tells Nicodemus that Israel as a nation must be born again. Jesus then continues and explains to Nicodemus several truths concerning the work of the Spirit. KJB John 3 verse 8 The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. 9 Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? 10 Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? 11 Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. 12 If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe, if I tell you of heavenly things? The Lord emphasized to Nicodemus that the nation of Israel had not received his witness. He told them about things he knew and had seen, but the majority of Jews remained in unbelief. Jesus is not simply referring to Nicodemus in the discussion. This truth is evident from the usage of plural pronouns in the passage from the KJB. The NKJV again mystifies the whole matter by not providing a clear presentation of the truth. NKJV John 3 verse 7 Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. 8 The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. 9 Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? 10 Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? 11 Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. 12 If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? All pronouns in these verses from the NKJV are changed to the generic you to make the Bible easier to read and understand. God has a purpose for even the pronouns he chooses. The pronoun changes in the NKJV cause the passage to sound as if the Lord is simply rebuking Nicodemus when, in reality, he is rebuking the entire nation of Israel for their unbelief. There are literally thousands of similar examples which could be cited. Why pick up a modern version which fails to distinguish between the singular and plural when they offer greater insight into the actual meaning of the text God gives us light and he expects us to turn toward it, certainly not away from it. When we reject this light, for whatever reason, frequently we find only darkness. In addition to scriptural illumination, our hymns also reveal a rich heritage. Unfortunately, along with the Bible from which they originate, these hymns likewise are undergoing revisions at the hands of modern critics. For sake of consistency, revisionists should update the hymns with the new pronouns. Read the updated song titles, see how they sound, and think about what is lost as a consequence of the kind of indiscriminate changes taking place by modern version producers. Come Thou Almighty King! Dash come you almighty king, how great thou art, how great you are. Come thou fount, dash come you fount, be thou my vision, dash be you my vision. My country, tis of thee, dash my country, 
tis of you. Note that the updated titles do not hold the same meaning without the pronouns found in a King James Bible. The excuse of the modern version producers for changing the pronouns to make things easier to understand simply lacks any credibility. If the hymns above should be updated, then what do you do with the songs below? Great is thy faithfulness. He is able to deliver thee. I am thine, O Lord. I need thee every hour. More love to thee. My Jesus, I love thee. It is estimated that the King James Bible's use of thee and ye versus the generic you gives greater accuracy to the translation and the interpretation of the Bible in some 2,000 different passages. Point four. The problems associated with the NKJV are far more widespread than simply changing the second person pronouns. As the next chapter demonstrates, many doctrines are also attacked in this version because its translators allowed the Alexandrian manuscripts, which underlie all other modern versions, to supersede readings found in the Textus Receptus. Those who allow their names to be associated with these modern versions frequently recant or wish they had greater discernment in these areas. Billy Graham's NKJV New Testament The preface to the New King James New Testament Billy Graham Counselor's Edition has multiple sections. In the section entitled Grasping God's Word, the picture below of a hand gripping the Bible is used to illustrate important aspects of the Bible. Hear, read, study, meditate, grasping God's Word. Oh, 1979, the New King James New Testament. Memorize. Thomas Nelson Publishers, Nashville, Tennessee, page 8. Each finger represents a practice which can be employed in order to help a person gain an understanding of the Word of God hence enabling them to grasp the Word of God. The five topics are here, read, study, memorize, and meditate. Fortunately, this is some good and sound advice, however, the presentation turns comical. It is true that a person would better know how to understand God's Word by incorporating all five things in his life. Examining the middle item, study, of the five suggested practices reveals how blindness overtakes those on the wrong side of this modern version debate. Each of the sections cites numerous quotes from the New King James Version as support. The middle finger says study, and the first three paragraphs found in that section are as follows. From the Billy Graham Counselor's Edition of the New King James New Testament. Study. Study is working at what we read with the intention of understanding, retaining, and utilizing the information. We retain about 50% of what we study. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Page 331. What does study mean? It means getting a pencil and paper and recording the truths that God shows you as you study. It means asking questions and answering them. It means comparing verse with verse, looking up a topic, and studying all you can about it. It means always asking the question, what does the Bible say about this subject? Emphasis mine. What does 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 in the New King James Version have to do with studying the Bible? This version, like every other modern version, has removed study from the verse. This particular translation gives a nice aid to help people spiritually, but it has no spiritual basis for doing so, since the NKJV deletes any reference to studying in the passage quoted to emphasize its point. To add insult to injury, note the final question in bold. The revisers present the question, what does the Bible say about this subject referring to any topic studied? However, answering the question concerning the topic at hand is more fun. The NKJV, along with every other modern perversion, removes the command to study, therefore, the answer to their question is as follows. The NKJV says absolutely nothing about the subject of studying God's Word. The revisers quote the right verse, but the wrong version. Read the same verse in the real King James Bible to see where the editors of this version got the idea to use this verse from 2 Timothy to emphasize the importance of Bible study. KJB 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. One might classify this as the ultimate faux pas. However, it is neither the funniest nor the dumbest thing these revisers have done. Here is another example. 
Thomas Nelson's advertising campaign sounds as evolutionary as Darwin's theories. According to their advertisement, we are continually evolving. Every word of the new King James Version has been checked against the original in light of the increasing knowledge about the Greek and Hebrew languages. Nothing has been changed except to make the original meaning clear. Emphasis mine. In light of their claim to have increasing knowledge in the languages of Greek and Hebrew, has anyone told these publishers about the annual decline in ACT scores and the dumbing down of school standards? Or, better yet, has anyone informed them as to what the real Bible says concerning the last days? It is a matter of choice. Who are you going to believe? The counterfeiters or God? This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Two for men shall be lovers of their own selves, seven ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 and 2, 7. Why no revival? Satan uses the domino effect. The standard advice given to the seminary student ultimately infects his congregation as follows. The student's goal must be to determine what God actually said and apply it to his life. To accomplish this he can rely on trustworthy translations and seek the aid of those who are acquainted with biblical languages 7, that is, the ultimate authority rests with the Greek and Hebrew professors and the student's loyalty must always be to his alma mater. Those teaching in the seminaries must remain relevant and actually superior. These Bible revisers claim to be making the Bible easier to understand. How is this goal accomplished when they remove the Bible's sole command to study and then make reference to a verse corrupted in their version in order to teach people the importance of studying the Bible, KJB, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17? The NKJV verse cited no longer remotely resembles a command to study. How did Thomas Nelson venture out in this new direction? In their own words, in the early 1970s, there appeared to be a growing concern over the fact that the revisions of 1881, 1901, and 1952 had used a Greek text that largely ignored the great majority of biblical manuscripts. Some were concerned that the words of men had begun to change the word of God, even if only in subtle ways. The comments of the Thomas Nelson publishers attacked the English Revised Version, 1881, the American Standard Version, 1901, and the Revised Standard Version, 1952, stating that they did in fact use a different Greek text, ignoring the majority text generally followed by the King James translators. Furthermore, take note that the last sentence recognizes the subtlety of the changes as designed by the instigator of all of this modernization, Genesis 3 verse 1. In 1975 Thomas Nelson Publishers, successor to the British firm that had first published the English Revised Version, 1885, the American Standard Version, 1901, and the Revised Standard Version, 1952, determined to assess the depth of this concern. How convenient to attack those versions that had already lost their market share. Notice that this excerpt makes no mention of any of the modern versions currently marketed by Thomas Nelson. It appears that these Bible producers were instead assessing the depth of the pockets of their potential customers. Take note who this list excludes. Because any revision of the scriptures must meet the needs of the public worship, Christian education, personal reading and study, leading clergymen and lay Christians were invited to meetings in Chicago, Illinois, and Nashville, Tennessee in 1975 and in London, England in 1976 to discuss the need for a new revision. Almost 100 church leaders from a broad spectrum of Christian churches attended those meetings. The expression of concern which Nelson Bible editors had been hearing for several years was confirmed by those in attendance. And there was a strong sentiment that the King James Bible should once more be sensitively revised in a way that would retain everything that could be retained of the text and language of that historic translation. Each of the selected scholars signed a statement of faith, declaring his belief that the scriptures in their entirety are the uniquely inspired word of God, free from error in the original autographs. Emphasis mine. Thomas Nelson publishers worded the statement very carefully. They knew what they were doing. They eliminated any possibility that a Bible believer would or could attend this meeting. How? Everyone had to agree with that the Ipture are free from COR in the Ori autographs. No true Bible believer believes that the original autographs are uniquely free from error. He believes that God has preserved his word and not uniquely limited his perfection to the originals. 
Those who signed the Statement of Exclusivity could not claim the King James Bible to be free from error. Thus, the scholars were freed from those pesky King James Bible believers and could claim that they had support across a broad spectrum. What Seth the Scriptures? Dr. Bill Grady, in his book Final Authority, gives a great illustration from the scripture as to why the true Bible believer will reject the NKJV as corrupt. In 2 Samuel 23 verses 9 to 10 and 1 Chronicles 11 verses 12 to 14, we have the brief account of Eliezer's engagement with the Philistines. While Chronicles details the spoil of Eliezer's victory, a parcel of ground full of barley, Samuel divulges the secret of his success and his hand clave unto the sword. From 1611 to 1881, God's foot soldiers wielded KJV swords while defending spiritual barley fields against Jesuits armed with the Duerim's version. Their grip grew tighter from 1881 to 1974 as one Alexandrian imposter after another was driven from the field. Suddenly, a profit-oriented corporation, the same crowd who manufactured the enemy's swords, would prevail upon the church to believe that the Holy Spirit had abruptly ordered the weapon change in the very heat of battle. Their corrupt rendering of Romans 1 verse 25 says it best. Instead of the KJV's changed we read, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. A true Bible believer will never exchange his KJV for a NKJV.2. Dr. Grady continues to point out that, although the NKJV claims to be translated from the Textus Receptus, its departure to the corrupt Westcott and Hort readings is easily identifiable. With the main English scripture supposedly translated from the traditional Textus Receptus, 774 instances appear where two alternative Greek texts are presented for consideration. These are the Old Westcott and Hort readings, perpetrated by the Nestle United Bible Society's text, designated as NU in the Hodges Farstad Nelson Majority Greek text, denoted by M in the footnotes. 10. Dr. Grady, quoting Dr. D.A. Wait, states, conservative estimates of the total translation changes in the NKJV are generally put at over 100,000. This is an average of 82 changes for each of the 12 19 pages in the NKJV. 11. That is a tremendous amount of change. Unfortunately, when the name King James appears within the title, many Christians are duped into believing that new means it is simply an updated KJB with minor variations. Evidence proves otherwise. The insanity will not cease until people begin to realize that they have no business messing with God's word. Many of the changes in these newer KJVs align themselves with the most corrupt versions on the market like the New World Translation, the New Century Version, and the Contemporary English Version. We do not have time nor space to deal with all of them. However, the next two chapters address further textual corruption in the NKJV. The material presented herein is far from exhaustive, however, it should enable any Bible student to make an informed decision. 1DA Weight, Defects in the NKJV, Collingswood, New Jersey, Dean Bergen Society, 1988, page 7. To the Holy Bible, New King James Version, Nashville, Tennessee, Thomas Nelson, 1982, Introduction, page 6. 3 Oswald T. Alice, The New English Bible, the New Testament of 1961, A Comparative Study, N.P. 1963, page 69. For Carter, things that are different are not the same, op. C.I.T. Page 150. 5. The New King James New Testament, Billy Graham Counselor's Edition. Nashville, Tennessee, Thomas Nelson, 1979. Page 9. 6. Advertisement, Moody Monthly, June 1982, back cover. Z. James B. Williams, ed., From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man, Greenville, South Carolina, Ambassador Emerald International, 1999, page 28. 8. The Holy Bible, New King James Version, Nashville, Tennessee, Thomas Nelson, 1982, pages 1233 to 1234. 9. William P. Grady, Ph.D., Final Authority, Sherville, Indiana, Grady Publications, 1993, page 303. 10 Ibid, page 304. 11 Ibid, page 305. 11. They call this new? No Bible believer should be deceived by the parading of great names in the field of biblical scholarship when these very men are but the parrots of the rationalists of another century. The case they present is not their own but a modern presentation of an ancient heresy. 
By lowering the Bible from the heaven of its divinity to depraved earth, they declare it to be but an ordinary book of mere human production. 1. Ian Paisley Thomas Nelson Publishers placed an advertisement on the back cover of the June 1982 Moody Monthly magazine stating that nothing has been changed except to make the original meaning clearer. To thus begin the career of one of the most insidious Bibles ever to hit the market, the New King James Version. Rather than making the Bible more understandable, the New King James Version obscures and changes the meanings of far too many biblical passages. With these changes, the NKJV generally aligns itself with the other modern versions, leaving the KJB to stand alone. They incorporate private interpretations of the scriptures which contradict corresponding passages found in the King James Bible. Furthermore, these modern versions also align themselves with the Christ-rejecting Jehovah's Witness version of the Bible, the New World Translation. To establish the pattern of corruption found in the modern translations, the following verse comparisons will include some or all of the following. Versions compared with respective first year of copyright. King James Bible, KJB, No Financial Copyright New World Translation, NWT, 1970. New International Version, NIV, 1973 New King James Version, NKJV, 1979 New Century Version, NCV, 1987. Contemporary English Version, CEV, 1995. The main emphasis of the next two chapters involves exploring the changes to the NKJV. Keep in mind that the changes incorporated into the text of the NKJV more closely align it with not only the Protestant and Catholic modern versions, but also the corrupt NWT of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Too superstitious or very religious? The historical part of the Book of Acts records Paul's missionary journeys. When the Apostle Paul arrives in Athens, he finds the people worshipping false gods in the midst of Mars Hill. KJB Acts 17 verse 22 Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Paul rebukes these people for having created a multitude of gods governing every facet of life, and for even going so far as to create a catch-all idol inscribed to the unknown god. Paul declares this unknown God by preaching to them Jesus Christ. He scolds them for being too superstitious asserting that their beliefs were absurd. Notice how the New International Version changes the whole tone of the interaction. The NIV puts words into the Apostles. Mouth that sound more like a commendation for dedicated religious service rather than one of condemnation for living superstitiously. Neve. Acts 17 verse 22 Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. In some cases, being very religious can be commendable. For instance, it is a good thing to be very religious about going to church or praying consistently. Consider the example found four chapters earlier. Those who were religious were persuading Paul and Barnabas to continue in the grace of God. Many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Acts 13 verse 43 The usage of this word in Acts chapter 13 does not convey a rebuke, nor did God intend it. But the Athenians in Acts chapter 17 were being rebuked for being superstitious in the true word of God. With this first comparison, note that the NKJV retains much of the wording of its beloved predecessor by partnering with the modern versions. NKJV Acts 17 verse 22 Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. The NKJV reading matches the modern versions by following the same corrupt manuscripts. Two newer versions, the New Century Version, NCV, and the Contemporary English Version, CV, also line up with the corrupt readings of the NIV and the NKJV. Time and time again, the King James Bible stands alone. Both the New Century Version and the Contemporary English Version follow the lead of their corrupt predecessors. NCV Acts 17 verse 22 Then Paul stood before the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I can see you are very religious in all things. CEV Acts 17 verse 22 So Paul stood up in front of the council and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious. These modern versions consistently agree in meaning with one another having been produced or influenced by the same underlying manuscripts. The Greek and Hebrew used to produce the modern versions are not the Greek and Hebrew of the King James Bible. Will Christ sit on David's throne? 
The KJB refers to the person of Christ sitting on the throne of David in the future. This verse also highlights Christ's resurrection and the future millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. KJB Acts 2 verse 30 Therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. This prophecy concerns the fact that the Father would raise up his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to sit on the throne of David. The NWT of the Jehovah's Witnesses completely obliterates these truths. This corrupt translation fails to reveal who will sit on the throne of David and lacks any reference to Christ's resurrection. No wonder Jehovah's Witnesses are so hard to reach with the gospel. NWT Acts 2 verse 30 Therefore, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath that he would seat one from the fruitage of his loins upon his throne, the Christ-rejecting NWT of the Jehovah's Witnesses not only perverts truth, but sounds absurd as well. This reading could apply to any of David's descendants including Solomon. The NIV, although not sounding as silly as the NWT, states that one of his descendants will sit on the throne. The NIV removes Christ entirely from the verse and from his rightful throne in both of these modern versions. Neve Acts 2 verse 30 But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Take note of the subtle change in the New King James Version, NKJV. Acts 2 verse 30 Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Satan has instigated these changes to mislead and deceive. No matter how pure the motives of some of the revisers, Satan's goal is accomplished when God's word is changed by man. The New King James Version says the Christ will sit on his throne. This particular wording denotes a position, rather than a person Jesus Christ. The end result cleverly removes Christ from his throne. Can you find Christ in the next two versions? NCV Acts 2 verse 30 He was a prophet and knew God had promised him that he would make a person from David's family a king just as he was. Remember the modern versions must make enough changes in order to qualify for their respective copyrights. Can all of these variations have arisen from the Greek manuscript from which these versions claim to be derived? It is a money-making scheme to dupe unsuspecting Christians and keep them and the lost in the dark concerning the truth of God's words. CEV Acts 2 verse 30 But David was a prophet, and he knew that God had made a promise he would not break. He had told David that someone from his family would someday be king. What did God really say about the one who would sit upon the throne of David? Who will it be? A. One from the fruitage of his loins? B. One of his descendants? C. The Christ? D. A person from David's family? E. Someone from his family? F. None of the above? During a test, no matter how close the answer, for instance, C. None of the above is still the correct answer. The Bible says that God promised to raise up Christ to sit on David's throne. This is not the Christ or simply some person from David's family. A comparison of an unlimited number of modern versions reveals that no two read exactly the same. Changes are necessary in order to qualify for a new copyright. No copyright means no control. No control means no money. No money, no profit, no stock sales, hell, Hades, or simply the grave. Since Acts 2 verse 27 and 231 convey similar points, they will be compared together. The previous verse attacks Christ's rightful place on the throne of David and ignores his resurrection. However, as any Bible believer knows, Christ was indeed resurrected. But, from where was the Son raised? According to the King James Bible, God raised his Son up from paradise after he crossed over the great gulf from hell. The Bible student understands that the Lord tasted death for every man, even the eternal death of the lost in hell. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2 verse 9 For this reason, when the Son of God died on the cross of Calvary, his soul went to hell and tasted the death of the lost. However, Jesus did not die for his own sins, therefore, hell could not hold him. Furthermore, his body saw no corruption. These points are borne out in Acts chapter 2. 
KJB. Acts 2 verse 27 Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. KJB. Acts 2 verse 31 He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. One must recognize that these passages refer to both Christ's soul and his flesh, or body. Christ's flesh did not corrupt in the sepulcher, neither was his soul left in hell. It is very important not to mix up these two. The Bible says that his soul was made an offering for sin, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah 53 verse 10 His soul was made an offering for sin but not left in hell. The Father raised him up. Unfortunately, some Christians are taught that the Lord only went into the paradise part of the heart of the earth. Were this the case, the plain teachings of scripture, which show that he went into the lower parts, plural, of the earth, would be violated. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Ephesians 4 verse 9. With this foundation, it is time to return to the comparisons. The New World Translation's changing of hell to Hades is understandable since the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or in a literal eternal hell. For this reason, the changes made to the NWT are expected. NWT Acts 2 verse 27 Because you will not leave my soul in Hades, neither will you allow your loyal one to see corruption. NWT Acts 2 verse 31 He saw beforehand and spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was he forsaken in Hades nor did his flesh see corruption. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that a man's existence ends at the grave. Thus, followers of Jehovah's Witness doctrine are particularly difficult to reach with the gospel. Take note how the Jehovah's Witnesses reject the Lord in the second passage by referring to the Christ. Now read the NIV and see what conclusions are drawn from its readings. No wonder saved and lost alike are questioning the very existence of hell as hell is changed to the grave. In so many versions, the NIV retains no reference to his soul in hell, but changes the application to me and the grave. Neve. Acts 2 verse 27 Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your holy one see decay. Neve. Acts 2 verse 31 Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. Eventually, hell will be completely removed from the modern versions. Hell has already been removed 40 times in the NIV, with the NIV addressing hell in only 14 instances, compared with the KJB's 53. The 40 removals equate to 75% of the time. Satan wishes for man to remain ignorant of his fate, and he does not want man to consider the repercussions of rejecting Christ as Savior. In its introduction, the NKJV claims to make the King James Bible much clearer by updating obsolete words. Hell must be one of those obsolete words. The NKJV replaces the word hell 23 times with the words Hades and Sheol. Claims of a simpler reading are simply bogus or outright lies. Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary defines Hades as the underground abode of the dead in Greek mythology. Therefore, according to the dictionary, Hades is not always a place of torment. For instance, the Assyrian Hades is an abode of blessedness with silver skies called happy fields. Furthermore, the New Age movement describes Hades as an intermediate state of purification. Now read the NKJV. NKJV. Acts 2 verse 27 For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. NKJV. Acts 2 verse 31 He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. The NKJV removes hell from both verses. What purpose, other than copyright justification, is served by changing hell to Hades? Is the Bible made clearer? Is the saint edified? Certainly not. Has the truth been obscured? You bet. It is obvious from newer translations such as the NCV and the CEV that the modern versions are grasping for more word changes to qualify for a copyright. Like the NIV, the NCV uses the word grave, but replaces decay with the word rot. NCV. Acts 2 verse 27 Because you will not leave me in the grave. You will not let your Holy One rot. NCV. Acts 2 verse 31 Knowing this before it happened, David talked about the Christ rising from the dead. 
He said, he was not left in the grave his body did not rot. Rot. Obviously, this is a new word used by a rotten translation vying for its copyright. Can you imagine David referring to the son and saying that the father would not let him rot? The CEV, in this case, aligns itself with the words chosen by the NIV. On occasion, revisers can do this and still qualify for a new copyright so long as other verses make additional changes. CEV Acts 2 verse 27 The Lord won't leave me in the grave. I am his holy one and he won't let my body decay. CEV Acts 2 verse 31 David knew this would happen and so he told us that Christ would be raised to life. He said that God would not leave him in the grave or let his body decay. The versions seem to play on a spiritual merry-go-round. The modern versions have gone from Hades, NWT, to the grave, NIV, back to Hades, NKJV, and finally back to the grave, NCV and NEV. Of course, each translation claims to be clearer than the one before it. It seems that they are as clear as freshly stirred mud. When someone mentions the most recognized passage in the Bible concerning hell, Luke chapter 16 usually comes to mind. Of course, this is the case only if you have not already traded in your King James Bible for the new, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9, King James Version or some other modern perversion. Here is the story of the rich man who dies and finds out the truth concerning eternity. KJB Luke 16 verse 23 And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Consistent with its other corrupt teachings, the NWT changes hell to Hades. NWT Luke 16 verse 23 And in Hades he lifted up his eyes, he existing in torments, and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in the bosom, position, with him. The NKJV how can one justify the NKJV's alignment with the doctrine of the Christ rejecting Jehovah's Witnesses? The NKJV was supposed to have been produced by fundamentalists for fundamentalists. The Bible Publishers could not steal away many of the faithful King James Bible readers until they found a better disguise for their corrupt readings. Along comes the NKJV. NKJV Luke 16 verse 23 And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. It is hard to imagine any God-called preacher warning his audience concerning the pitfalls that ended with the rich man in Hades. Maybe his sermonizing goes something like this, Our message today concerns a very terrible place. I will be preaching on Hades. Turn in your new King James versions to Luke chapter 16 and we will begin reading. A big yawn follows from the audience as attention turns to their iPhones, iPads, or simply their closed eyelids. Unfortunately, the lost in the audience will find themselves falling asleep on that one too. No wonder Satan has finally achieved his ultimate objective creating enough confusion and discord so that everyone with fingers pointed has someone else to blame. Now focus your attention on two of the more recent versions produced in the 1980s and 90s. No longer do the versions discuss hell or even Hades. Instead, in these newest versions, hell has become the place of the dead. NCV Luke 16 verse 23 In the place of the dead, he was in much pain. The rich man saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. How can anyone justify this continued perversion of truth? God warned us thousands of years ago not to change his word. What happens when we accept a small change? A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Galatians 5 verse 9 When one accepts a little change, the floodgates soon open. Satan is never satisfied with a small perversion of the truth. His ultimate goal is the condemnation of man which comes through blindness to the truth. These versions are the very tools capable of fulfilling his ultimate goal. Notice that the NCV changes torments to pain also. There is a significant difference between these two. Pain can be something as simple as a mild headache. Torment denotes a much greater degree of suffering. Likewise, implicit with the use of the word torment is an understanding that such suffering is actively inflicted upon the recipient. Since Luke chapter 16 is the most preached passage concerning hell in the King James Bible, the next passage is even more problematic. The most descriptive terminology in the Bible describing hell is also found here. The KJB depicts hell as a place of torment offering the reader a powerful, convincing, and revealing description. 
The rich man in hell, or Hades, the grave, or the place of the dead, is in torment and wants to warn his five brothers. He does not want them to also go to hell, or Hades, the grave, or the place of the dead. KJB Luke 16 verse 28 For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. For this verse, we will compare only the most recent additions in our discussion. If this subject were not so serious, it would be humorous. Instead of hell being referred to as a place of torment, the NCV describes the place of the dead as a place of pain. How sad! NCV Luke 16 verse 28 I have five brothers, and Lazarus could warn them so that they will not come to this place of pain. The word of God conveys the only truth we know about God, salvation, eternal life, and damnation. No matter how ridiculous the changes, there seems to be no limit to them. Once again, the modern translators have run out of words. Now, hell the place of torment is just a horrible place. C.E.V. Luke 16 verse 28 Let him warn my five brothers, so they won't come to this horrible place. The slums in some inner cities could fit this description, but they are not hell. Some third world countries contain horrible places, but these locations are not hell. A horrible place on earth would never be labeled as this place of torment. No wonder preaching has lost its power. Preachers preaching from the modern versions no longer have the power derived from the power source. There is no conviction and less light than that given off by a firefly. These modern versions offer the reader no comparison and no Bible study. However, the confusion continues to run rampant. 1 Corinthians refers to death and its aftermath. The King James Bible correctly refers to the body being placed in the grave. Confusingly, the NKJV changes grave to Hades in this passage. We have already seen that the NKJV changes hell to Hades, and now it changes grave to Hades. Is one to draw some type of parallel? Is the grave really the hell of the KJB, as the Jehovah's Witnesses proclaim and as the NKJV purports? First, consider the background. The Apostle Paul begins by reflecting upon the day when man's mortal body, those who are saved, will be changed into a glorified body. Christians have reason to shout. 1 Corinthians offers one of the greatest accounts for the future of a Christian, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, 52 in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 53 For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 53. He continues, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54. When the Lord returns for those who are his, death and the grave will lose their strength because not another Christian will ever face death or the grave. KJB 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55 O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Christians living at that time known as the rapture will never experience death. Therefore, death and the grave will lose their power over the child of God, similar to hell losing its power over the Christian at the moment of salvation. Once again, the NKJV must incorporate enough changes to justify the issuance of a copyright. The authors decided to change the grave to Hades. These changes are made at the expense of truth and Bible doctrines. This change is heretical when combined with the rich man in Hades in Luke chapter 16. NKJV 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55 O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The consequences of these changes combined together are incomprehensible. Confusion results when the soul of the lost rich man of Luke chapter 16 is found in the very place, Hades hell, that the body of the saved Christian ended up prior to the rapture, Hades grave. This is doctrinally unsound. The Christian need not be concerned about hell, or Hades, or the place of the dead. To indicate otherwise is to place doubt upon the doctrine of eternal security, the efficacy of the cross, and the precious blood atonement. For the sake of conciseness, a simple list of similar NKJV changes should suffice. The NKJV removes hell in all of the following passages, 2 Samuel 22 verse 6, Job 11 verse 8, 
Job 26 verse 6, Psalm 16 verse 10, Psalm 18 verse 5, Psalm 86 verse 13, Psalm 116 verse 3, Isaiah 514, Isaiah 14 verse 15, Isaiah 28 verse 15, Isaiah 28 verse 18, Isaiah 57 verse 9, Jonah 2 verse 2, Matthew 11 verse 23, Matthew 16 verse 18, Luke 10 verse 15, Luke 16 verse 23, Acts 2 verse 27, Acts 2 verse 31, Revelation 1 verse 18, Revelation 6 verse 8, Revelation 20 verse 13, and Revelation 20 verse 14. Many of these other verses could be studied in greater depth, but the core problem has been clearly identified. It has been said that anyone attempting to air condition hell is probably getting ready to move there. What conclusion may be drawn concerning a person attempting to get rid of hell altogether? This generally indicates the place where they will eventually inhabit. Unfortunately, their lying is causing others to join them there. Jesus accepts worship. Satan knows the scripture better than we do. His desire remains to usurp God's rightful place and position. The Lord rebuked him for seeking worship. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Luke 4 verse 10. Satan hated hearing these words because one of his greatest desires is that of worship. His hatred for God causes him to steal the worship rightfully belonging to God alone. The devil also knows that the Lord's acceptance of worship is a proof of his deity. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus accepted worship. KJB Matthew 20 verse 20 Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. In typical fashion, the Jehovah's Witness version sets a precedent by making drastic changes. It changes worship to obeisance. NWT. Matthew 20 verse 20 Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee approached him with her sons, doing obeisance and asking for something from him. The NIV follows the trend of the Jehovah's Witnesses stealing the worship away from the Savior. 2. Neve. Matthew 20 verse 20 Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. The NWT, NIV, and NKJV are three Ps in one pod. The NKJV follows suit of the two previous corruptions. One person's kneeling down before another does not necessarily indicate that the first person is worshipping the second. NKJV Matthew 20 verse 20 Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. Remember the copyright. Further translations cannot simply say kneeling down, Two of the other versions have already used those words. Instead, in the newest versions, Zebedee's wife just bows down. NCV Matthew 20 verse 20 Then the wife of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons. She bowed before him and asked him to do something for her. Remember the copyright requirements. This time, the past tense of the NIV and the NKJV suffice for the change, thus she knelt down, begging. CEV Matthew 20 verse 20 The mother of James and John came to Jesus with her two sons. She knelt down and started begging him to do something for her. We have moved from obeisance NWT to kneeling down NIV NKJV to bowing before him NCV and now to kneeling down and begging CV. Another copyright granted more money should be flowing in the coffers. Satan knows that begging for something does not bring to mind the act of worship. Had the earliest modern versions never paved the way, the current changes could and would not have become so radical. God laid down his life. The book of 1 John provides another powerful verse irrefutably proving Christ's deity. KJB 1 John 3 verse 16 Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Grammatically, he, God, laid down his mortal life as a man for us. Thank God for this clear-cut proof of Christ's deity. After reading this verse from the King James Bible, one cannot sensibly refute the fact that Jesus is God. Unless, of course, the reader uses the NWT, NIV, NKJV, NCV, CV, or any of a host of other modern versions to supplant the truth of the KJB. Let's consider first the Christ rejectors before we consider the versions put out by those who should know better. NWT 1 John 3 verse 16 By this we have come to know love, because that one surrendered his soul for us, and we are under obligation to surrender our souls for our brothers. God is ripped from the text. 
The Christ-rejecting NWT gives no indication of who laid down his life. The Jehovah's Witnesses can easily justify the change. They do not conceal their hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ when they refer to him as a god in John 1 verse 1. However, one would think that the NIV and the other Christian-produced versions would be more protective of verses substantiating the Lord's deity. Not so, Neve. 1 John 3 verse 16 This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. The NIV follows suit by naming Jesus Christ, thus eliminating a contextual proof of the Lord's deity. The NIV eliminates the possibility of the reader using this verse to prove that Jesus Christ is God. What about the so-called modernized King James Bible? Par for the course. This time, God is missing altogether. NKJV. 1 John 3 verse 16 By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Did God lay down his life in the form of a man on the cross of Calvary? All of the modern versions corrupt the text thus undermining another clear proof of the Lord's deity. The NCV and the CEV bring Jesus back, as does their sister NIV, but none of them provide any proof of Christ's deity in this passage. NCV 1 John 3 verse 16 This is how we know what real love is. Jesus gave his life for us. So we should give our lives for our brothers and sisters. CEV 1 John 3 verse 16 We know what love is because Jesus gave his life for us. That's why we must give our lives for each other. The modern versions claim to contain the major doctrines, and, in some cases, this is true. However, corruption of truth into complete destruction is a process. Every instance of a particular doctrine is rarely removed except over time. Satan has patience and realizes that it is the key to deception. Perversion of truth occurs one step at a time, Proverbs 22 verse 28. 20 years ago, the devil knew that there was very little market for something as corrupt as the NCV or the CEV. The world was not yet ready to accept their magnitude of changes without first experiencing the influence of earlier, pioneering Bible revisions, perversions. As the more prominent modern versions appeared on the market decades ago, the changes found in the NCV and CEV would have been considered far too insidious. Christians were still all too familiar with the true readings from the King James Bible. Think about it. Even the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses contain some truth within their teachings, but their leaven leavens the truths corrupting their teachings, Galatians 5 verse 9. Decades ago, the uproar over the modern changes would have been are too widespread. The readers of these modern versions would have recognized specific changes and yelled, the blood's gone, the gospel's gone, preaching's gone, the deity is gone, the virgin birth is gone. These are not the words of God, but the words of men. However, these newer versions are marketed to those who have been gradually weaned away from the truth by subtle and gradual changes. These comparisons should reveal that an individual who prefers the NIV is less likely to recognize the problems associated with an NCV than someone who is a student of the KJB. The Spirit of God in the believer reveals the glaring errors in the modern versions when compared to the KJB. When God's wrath is revealed. We are commanded to study God's word, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. The right study with the right Bible will lead a person to the right conclusions. The King James Bible says that God's wrath is not revealed all of the time. In other words, it is not revealed against all unrighteousness. One can easily understand when God's wrath is revealed against man by considering the truth revealed in the following KJB passage. KJB Romans 1 verse 18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The Bible clearly states that God's wrath is revealed against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who possess the truth and nevertheless live unrighteously. These possessors of the truth evidently ignore the light of the truth and continue to participate in unrighteous acts for which God must judge them. Citizens of the United States should heed this warning as especially applicable to us in this day and age. Americans have held the word of God for centuries now and today, more than ever, we are holding it in unrighteousness. God's wrath is beginning to be increasingly revealed against us. Consider the corruption found within our three branches of government. Meditate for a while on our less desirable weather patterns, rampant crime rates, family disintegration, and the acceptance of perversion as the norm. We are an especially guilty nation, we are holding the truth in unrighteousness. 
The judgment of God can be witnessed everywhere. Does the Christ rejecting NWT convey the same truth? Does it warn those who are holding the truth in unrighteousness? No, it changes the entire meaning of this verse. NWT Romans 1 verse 18 For God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who are suppressing the truth in an unrighteous way. The Jehovah's Witnesses change the truth of God into a lie. Their version no longer asserts that the wrath of God comes upon all those who simply hold the truth in unrighteousness. Instead, their translation changes this warning to be applicable only to those who suppress the truth. This change really becomes somewhat humorous because the rebuke is additionally limited to those that suppress the truth in an unrighteous way. I suppose if people were more righteous in their suppression of the truth, this would be acceptable. Either way, the authors of this change fall under the preceding warning because, as they change the truth, they suppress it too. However, no matter what these Christ-rejecting infidels write, God's wrath is not limited to those who suppress his truth. Who do the NIV and NKJV align themselves with? The truth or the Jehovah's Witnesses? Neve. Romans 1 verse 18 The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. NKJV. Romans 1 verse 18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The NIV and the NKJV follow the example of the Jehovah's Witnesses, an unholy alliance which alone should raise red flags. However, most modern versions go even further in their destruction of truth. The NCV says that God's anger is shown against all of the bad things people do. NCV. Romans 1 verse 18 God's anger is shown from heaven against all the evil and wrong things people do. Everyone should be especially thankful that the NCV is not really the word of God and that God's anger is not always manifested as claimed. The NCV eliminates God's mercy, grace, and long-suffering. On the other hand, the CEV reverts to the suppression of the truth taught by the corrupt NWT, NIV, and NKJV. However, it embraces modern-day terminology. CEV Romans 1 verse 18 From heaven God shows how angry he is with all the wicked and evil things that sinful people do to crush the truth. Everyone should simply ignore this lie. God's judgment comes against all those who have the truth and yet live unrighteously. Although the modern versions pervert the application of this passage, God's word holds true. Crime, wickedness, divorce, and abortion rates have steadily increased since 1963 when the United States Supreme Court began making new laws while ignoring legal precedent. Limiting the influence of Christianity seemed to be their primary goal. Since that time, the world has witnessed a steady decline in America's power and prestige. As a nation, America is guilty of holding the truth in unrighteousness. For that very reason, as a country, we have experienced and are experiencing a taste of God's judgment. Changing the truth of God into a lie. The Bible warns that God will give up to uncleanness anyone who changes the truth of God into a lie. KJB Romans 1 verse 25 Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. America is guilty once again. For instance, almost every state in the nation once had laws recognizing sodomy and pornography as illegal. Today, hate crime laws have been enacted giving legal protection to sodomites. The Supreme Court claims that the First Amendment protects the rights of those who desire to distribute illicit trash. Americans have legitimized that which God condemns in his book. We have changed the truth of God into a lie by claiming that sodomy is merely an alternative lifestyle and that the rights of pornographers are equal to the rights of legitimate authors. No wonder our schools graduate the illiterate and have become killing grounds for teens and preteens alike. God admonishes those who possess the truth and then change the truth into a lie. Instead, the NWT completely distorts God's admonition. NWT. Romans 1 verse 25 Even those who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and venerated and rendered sacred service to the creation rather than the one who created, who is blessed forever. Amen. Instead of warning those busy changing the truth, the NWT directs its rebuke against those who exchange the KJB for one of the modern versions. Changing the truth is a much more serious offense than exchanging the truth for the lie created by someone else. 
Of course, the NIV follows the course charted by the NWT. Neve. Romans 1 verse 25 They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. The NKJV follows suit. NKJV. Romans 1 verse 25 Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The NCV uses new words, but basically follows the lead of the modern version that preceded it. NCV. Romans 1 verse 25 They traded the truth for a lie. They worshipped and served what had been created instead of the God who created those things, who should be praised forever. Amen. The CEV decided to dig into the depths of the original Greek. What did they find? They gave up the truth. CEV. Romans 1 verse 25 They gave up the truth about God for a lie, and they worshipped God's creation instead of God, who will be praised forever. Amen. Again, the CEV attacks the innocent victim rather than the perpetrator. These Bible producers must wear out the thesaurus trying to find synonyms. God warns those who change the truth of God into a lie. The modern translations change this truth into something God never intended by rebuking all those who exchange or trade the truth, KJB, for the lie perpetrated by the modern versions. The difference between changing and exchanging would be equivalent to condemning the innocent recipient of a counterfeit bill, rather than the one creating the counterfeit. Which book stands alone? KJB equals changed. NWT equals exchanged NIV equals exchanged. NKJV equals exchanged. NCV equals traded. CEV equals gave up. What do you prefer? Take your pick. All of the versions stand together in solidarity against the King James Bible. Has the version that God has blessed above all others, the KJB, been lying all these years and only now we have its true meaning or meanings? Or has the devil finally been able to convince enough greedy people to change the truth into a lie? No wonder we do not have the great and wonderful revivals of past generations the lies of Satan are designed to destroy revival. 1 Ian Paisley, My Plea for the Old Sword, Belfast, Northern Ireland, 1997, P. 1314. 2 Advertisement, Moody Magazine, 820, North LaSalle Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60610, June 1982. 12. No new thing under the sun truth is not only violated by falsehood. It may be equally outraged by silence. Henri Frederick Armiel. Many of those who attack the cross and its meaning consider Christians to be foolish. However, the Bible reveals that those who believe the cross to be foolish do so because they are spiritually lost. Therefore, true Bible preaching always magnifies the significance of Christ's work on the cross. Similar to the previous chapter, we will be making comparisons directly to the Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation, NWT, the religious group that believes Jesus to be a created being and simply a God, John 1 verse 1 NWT. As we consider the comparisons to this cultic Bible version, you will again see that the other modern versions march lockstep with the NWT. It is the King James Bible that stands alone. Case in point. KJB. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Churches following Christ in purity are led by preachers who preach about the cross and choose to sing about it too. Why do you suppose the NWT would replace the cross with the torture stake? NWT. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 For the speech about the torture stake is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is God's power. Those who produce the modern versions admit using the same Greek text followed by the New World Translation editors, thus the similarities between the NWT and the other modern versions. How can anyone justify producing a Bible that aligns itself with the Christ-rejecting New World Translation? Consider the three problems found in this single verse in the NWT, the importance of preaching is diminished, and simply called speech, the cross is eliminated, and changed to the torture stake, and salvation is taught as a process, one is being saved. Some reader still enamored by his particular modern version might assert that at least my translation is not as bad as the NWT. But how far is too far and how bad is bad enough? Neve. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. The NIV incorporates two of the three alterations found in the New World Translation. 
preaching is replaced by the NIV translators. Rather than using the word speech as the NWT does, the NIV again changes preaching to the message. Both the NWT and NIV agree that a person is being saved, a process. Can you imagine the shock and outrage by NIV users if the NIV also changed the cross to a torture stake? The authors of the NIV were not so foolish as to follow the NWT's example by inserting the torture stake in place of the cross. The Christian Bibles must leave the cross in the text although they delete Calvary, Luke 23 verse 33, the one time it is found in the KJB. Thus, the alterations are tweaked depending upon the target audience of each translation. Leaving the cross intact is commendable, however, the supremacy of preaching is lessened and the verse now teaches salvation as a process. Ditto for the New King James Version. NKJV. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Answer this question, do you know that you have eternal life? If you answered yes, then you are not being saved. This verse alone may be sufficient to convince a baby Christian that he must work to stay saved. The cults know how to effectively use these so-called Bibles to gain converts to their false teachings. Sometimes the cults have more zeal than Christians who have the truth and know the truth, yet fail to defend it. The New Century Version, NCV, had to produce further changes in order to secure its copyright. Preaching to speech to message and now teaching. NCV. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 The teaching about the cross is foolishness to those who are being lost, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Evidently, the contemporary English version, CV, incorporated enough changes elsewhere to meet their copyright requirements so they chose to use the same terminology, message, as the NIV and the NKJV. They chose to use, the cross doesn't make any sense to lost people to qualify for their copyright. Do you see what they are doing? CEV. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 The message about the cross doesn't make any sense to lost people. But for those of us who are being saved, it is God's power at work. The most important thing lost in the verse was the truth. Every preacher should be Christ-like. He should elevate preaching and preach that salvation takes place at a point in time when a person accepts the Savior and becomes a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. The Christians has not become a new creation, NIV, NKJV, etc., through a process of time by works or any other means. Blasphemous Trash The all-wise God, Jude 25, but only if you refer to a KJB, proclaims that the act of preaching is foolish. God chose a method whereby one man stands up week after week, coaxing and persuading diligently from the same book. No wonder this seems foolish to an unregenerate world. However, God chose this foolish method to save those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. KJB 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Imagine Noah's preaching for 120 years to four different generations concerning impending doom, 2 Peter 2 verse 5. Noah preached about rain falling from the heavens which seemed quite foolish to that generation because it had never yet rained upon the earth. Christ's work can never be equated to Noah's preaching. Yet, the NWT changes the object of the foolishness from the act of preaching to that which is preached. This is downright blasphemy. NWT 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 For since, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not get to know God. God saw good through the foolishness of what is preached to save those believing. Of course, we know that the editors of the NWT considered preaching about the cross foolish because they replaced the cross with the torture stake. They also considered preaching about Jesus Christ foolishness because they consider him a lesser God than the Father. NWT John 1 colon 1 a God one must consider the implications of the NIVs agreeing with the Jehovah's Witness Bible concerning the foolishness of that which is preached. Neve. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. For a moment clear your mind of any distractions and consider the import of what is being conveyed, lest you miss the point. What does a God-called preacher emphasize in his preaching? The blood, the cross, the Savior, the virgin birth, godly living, etc. The modern versions blasphemously referred to these things as foolish. 
Yet, most modern-day Christians do not realize that their Bibles show the same disregard for preaching in Christ as the Jehovah's Witnesses. The NKJV joins ranks with the NWT and the NIV to blaspheme our Savior and His work, as well. NKJV 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 For since, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The NCV needed its copyright. Note the resultant changes are not as bad as the NWT, NIV, and NKJV. A message that sounds foolish is not as bad a rendering as referring to the preaching or message itself as foolish. NCV 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 In the wisdom of God the world did not know God through its own wisdom. So God chose to use the message that sounds foolish to save those who believe. The CEV uses similar measures as its predecessors and reverts back to the blasphemy of the NWT, NIV, and NKJV. CEV 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 God was wise and decided not to let the people of this world use their wisdom to learn about Him. Instead, God chose to save only those who believe the foolish message we preach. The message is not foolish. The God-ordained method of preaching is, one should not view a man or woman who believes in the authority and supremacy of one book as a weirdo or a fanatic. Rather, such a person should be appreciated for keeping the battle raging, 1 Timothy 6 verse 12, and not becoming weary in well-doing, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 13. However, the Bible believer should not berate those unfamiliar with the differences either. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians 6 verse 1 Doctrine changed to teaching. Paul preached doctrine. Bible doctrine refers to sound teaching based on the word of God. The Bible calls this doctrine the doctrine of the Lord. In other words, Paul preached the Lord's doctrine, not his own. KJB Acts 13 verse 12 Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. All of the modern versions claim to be making the Bible easier to understand. Considering the introduced changes, it is impossible to identify where the modern versions have made the truth more easily comprehended. For instance, in the next verse, how is clarity achieved by changing deputy to proconsul? Certainly no one apart from a JW would claim that the New World Translation makes the Word of God clearer or easier to understand. NWT Acts 13 verse 12 Then the proconsul, upon seeing what had happened, became a believer, and he was astounded at the teaching of Jehovah. The NWT is not easier to understand and neither is the NIV. The NIV follows the example set by its predecessor, the NWT. Both versions incorporate some of the same terminology. Could this be because they actually originate from the same source? Neve. Acts 13 verse 12 When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Someone might be relieved to realize that the NIV does not change Lord to Jehovah. However, the NIV does remove the doctrine of the Lord changing it to the teaching about the Lord. Doctrine is a Bible word with spiritual connotations. Ditto concerning the NKJV. Instead of using the word about, the NKJV changes this verse to read of the Lord. Just another effort to attain a copyright. A few words altered here and there produce two different Bibles, two separate copyrights, and twice the prophets. NKJV Acts 13 verse 12 Then the proconsul believed, when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The NKJV changes the wording to the teaching of the Lord. When reading this verse, one wonders, who is teaching? Was the Lord giving one of his famous sermons? Or was the Apostle Paul preaching the Lord's doctrines? No wonder people are confused concerning the Bible. Now we again direct our attention to the versions produced in the 1980s and 90s. These newest versions shift from using deputy or proconsul to deciding the man was governor. From reading these modern versions, it is difficult to discern this man's true title. Read a few other versions not addressed herein and see what other words these Bible editions have used. NCV Acts 13 verse 12 When the governor saw this, he believed because he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. CEV Acts 13 verse 12 When the governor saw what had happened, he he put his faith in the Lord. Amazed at this teaching about the Lord. So, a person should be dogmatic about the doctrines of the Lord. Paul was. 
He did not waver on these doctrines. The whole emphasis in the modern versions has changed from a dogmatic type of faith to a superficial type of belief. We need to be dogmatic about Bible doctrines such as the infallibility of Scripture, God's mercy and grace, eternal security of the believer, and man's responsibility to live holy. These are Bible truths from the old black book that have convicted the sinner, converted the soul, and ensured that Christians know how to walk with God in spirit and truth for centuries. All modern versions peddle the word. During the first century, the predecessor manuscripts of those now dubbed as the oldest and best were corrupted by prominent anti-Christian scribes. Contrary to the claims of the proponents of the modern versions, prolonged existence of any particular manuscript does not indicate authenticity or credibility. To understand the issue, simply peruse the footnotes attached to many of the passages differing from the KJB, which read the oldest and best. It is true that the older the manuscript, the longer it has survived and the closer to the originals. However, in all likelihood, those aged manuscripts owe their longevity to rejection by the church. Manuscripts regularly used by the church wore out and had to be recopied. Out of respect for the word of God, the worn out manuscripts were destroyed once copied. Oldest and best may be more aptly dubbed oldest and rejected by true students of history. Take note that the Apostle Paul warns, prior to finishing his epistles to the church, of many who were corrupting the very words of God. KJB 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Thank God for his promises concerning his word. The true word of God is incorruptible, 1 Peter 1 verse 23 KJB. However, during the first century, some scribes were already busy trying to confuse the brethren by destroying the true faith. None of the modern versions admit to this fact, but again make themselves doubly guilty. They not only corrupt the true word of God, but also transgress their own new standard by peddling their particular versions of the Bible. Notice the similarities in their readings. NWT 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 We are, for we are not peddlers of the word of God as many men are, but as out of sincerity, yes, as sent from God, under God's view, in company with Christ, we are speaking. Neve. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. NKJV 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. NCV 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 We do not sell the word of God for a profit as many other people do. But in Christ we speak the truth before God, as messengers of God. Are we to believe that they do not peddle the new international version or sell the new century versions for a profit? I guess these Bible publishers want to convince us that publication of the NIV and NCV were simply labors of love. Now, read the 1995 version for added humor or to bring a tear to your eye, if you care. CEV 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 A lot of people try to get rich from preaching God's message. But we are God's sincere messengers, and by the power of Christ we speak our message with God as our witness. It almost seems a waste of time and energy to comment further on these modern perversions. They are all peddling their version based on corrupt manuscripts producing a corrupt output. They certainly do not all say the same thing. The CEV may have a valid point, but it seems quite hypocritical to emphasize the preacher's sin while ignoring its own shortcomings found in the CEV. God cares about appearances. Satan wants anyone desiring to be a dedicated Christian ignorant of the highest standard sets forth in God's word. Although addressed earlier concerning the NIV, here is one such case in point. KJB 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. It is clear that once a person becomes a Christian, God demands a high standard of living. Not only does he expect a person to live above the wickedness of this world, but he also expects us to be conscious concerning our testimonies at all time. For this reason, the child of God is to abstain from anything that looks even remotely suspicious. In the KJB, God commands us to abstain from even the appearance of evil. Compare God's expectations with those conveyed by the modern versions. NWT 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 Abstain from every form of wickedness. 
Neve. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 Avoid every kind of evil. NKJV. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 Abstain from every form of evil. NCV. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 And stay away from everything that is evil. CEV. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 And don't have anything to do with evil. Each version must uniquely qualify for a copyright by changing enough words. However, by changing the words, these modern versions fail to proclaim God's true expectations. They limit the warning only to those things evil or wicked in themselves, rather than including the things that simply appear evil. Sin abounds because the modern versions fail to adequately warn against the wiles of the devil. For instance, a young teenage boy inviting a girl to his home without any parental supervision is not necessarily evil. Yet, it certainly has the potential to destroy the reputation of each of them. It also can lead to some very serious problems created by the enticing environment. On the contrary, if we teach our children to live by the higher standard of the Word of God, KJB, they might not have to suffer the disastrous outcomes, out-of-wedlock pregnancies, STDs, destroyed reputations, etc., from avoidable situations. Abstain from the appearance of evil. The love of money. The modern versions have a real problem revealing God's explicit warnings concerning money, getting gain, and inordinate affection for the same, see chapter 5. 1 Timothy says that we are to withdraw ourselves from anyone who thinks that gain, the accumulation of wealth, indicates godliness. KJB 1 Timothy 6 verse 5 perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. If the amount owned is an indication of godliness, then everyone should join with Rome. According to figures compiled in June 1965, the Roman Catholic institution had accumulated a minimum of $80 billion in real estate in the United States alone. Point one. If wealth determines blessedness from God, join fellowship with the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, or Muslims. These entities have also amassed great wealth, though not to the extent of Roman Catholicism. The NWT fails to express God's command to separate. This is standard operating procedure for the shallow unbiblical modern Christianity promoting unity at all costs. The KJB tells Christians to withdraw from any individual who thinks a person's wealth signifies his level of spirituality. The NWT makes no such pronouncement and gives no warning. NWT 1 Timothy 6 verse 5 Violent disputes about trifles on the part of men corrupted in mind and despoiled of the truth, thinking that godly devotion is a means of gain. The NWT contradicts the KJB pronouncements. It condemns those who think that godly devotion is not a means of gain. Is it not? Living for God should be encouraged as the only way to truly prosper. Notice how the NIV again aligns itself with the NWT. Neve. 1 Timothy 6 verse 5 and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. The NIV discourages godliness. Likewise, the NKJV aligns itself with both the NWT and the NIV. NKJV. 1 Timothy 6 verse 5 Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. These versions rebuke someone who thinks that godliness is a means to gain. Godliness should be the only means to true financial gain. The alternative is to ascribe ungodliness as the preferred method for acquiring wealth. The NCV though technically right changes the entire context of the passage. NCV 1 Timothy 6 verse 5 and constant quarrels from those who have evil minds and have lost the truth. They think that serving God is a way to get rich. CEV, 1 Timothy 6 verse 5 and nasty quarrels. They have wicked minds and have missed out on the truth. These people think religion is supposed to make you rich. The King James Bible says one thing and all of the modern versions another. The KJB says, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. By lining up the modern versions together, the consistent pattern of corruption becomes more striking. Thinking that godly devotion is a means of gain. NWT Who think that godliness is a means to financial gain? Neve Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain? From such withdraw yourself. NKJV They think that serving God is a way to get rich. NCV These people think religion is supposed to make you rich. 
CEV. The new King James Version deliberately inserts the corrupt Alexandrian text readings again moving away from the Textus Receptus readings. Think about what it actually says. Instead of warning against those who look at the possessions and bank accounts to determine one's spirituality, they rebuke anyone who thinks the only way to become prosperous is through spirituality. Here is another example concerning money in which the NKJV follows the corruption of its predecessor. The love of money is the root of all evil. KJB 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The Jehovah's Witnesses version crafted by their hierarchy changes this truth dramatically. No longer is the rigid warning given concerning an inordinate affection for money. NWT 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 For the love of money is a root of all sorts of injurious things, and by reaching out for this love some have been led astray from the faith and have stabbed themselves all over with many pains. The New World Translation says a root of all sorts of injurious things. The NIV and the NKJV follow suit with the Christ-rejecting Jehovah's Witnesses. What justification do the Christian revisers use for aligning themselves with this blasphemous group? The same excuse used to justify the changes by the authors of the NWT the oldest and best manuscripts. Neve. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. NKJV 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Of course, the NCV and the CEV always pervert the truth to a greater degree than their predecessors. Root is completely missing in the newest versions. NCV 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 The love of money causes all kinds of evil. Some people have left the faith because they wanted to get more money, but they have caused themselves much sorrow. The CEV not only removes the root, but also the evil. Comparisons like this should dispel the claim that all the Bibles read alike. The modernization of the Bible sheds no light on the truth and instead places a person in darkness. CEV 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 The love of money causes all kinds of trouble. Some people want money so much that they have given up their faith and caused themselves a lot of pain. We have moved from the love of money being the root, KJV, to a root, NIV, NKJV, to no root at all, NCV, CEV. The root nourishes the plant, just as the love of money feeds all evil. This is not to say that sin does not exist apart from the love of money. It does, but when one considers all manner of evil in the world, he can usually very easily trace any form of it back to the love of money. In closing, why, you may wonder, have these truths and their associated falsehoods not been well publicized? They have been, but who is listening? The seminaries rejected these truths long ago and only now are some of them having to face the error of their ways. This phenomenon is taking place as a result of the grassroots efforts of many who have not given up on the fight, men and women who fear God more than man. Why not join in this fight for the faith? If you don't let your voice be heard, how will others know where you stand? Maybe there are others just waiting for that one voice, Acts 24 verse 21, that one man or woman to speak up and speak out. There are indeed many people who can see these truths just as plainly as you. There is a time for silence, and there is a definite time to let your voice be heard, Romans 13 verse 11. It is time to speak up. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, seven a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. 1 Avro Manhattan, The Vatican Billions, Chino, California, Chick Publications, 1983, 188. <laughs>